Hi everyone, my name is Pierce, and I'm the director of the Transnational Literature Series here at Brooklyn Booksmith, and your host for tonight's conversation. I want to open up the space by saying thank you for coming out tonight. The Booksmith has been around since 1961, and that's because of our wonderful community. Your support means we can keep having events like this, so thank you again. As you may know, tonight's event is part of our ongoing Transnational Literature Series, which focuses on stories of migration, the intersection of politics and literature, and works in translation. If you enjoyed tonight's event, please check out our full events lineup online at brooklynbooksmith.com so you don't miss some of the amazing authors we have coming up this summer, both virtually and in store. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram for updates. Toward the end of the event, we'll leave about 15 minutes or so for an audience Q&A followed by a signing. We have copies of Dreaming the Mountain available over at the register. And please take a moment to silence your cell phones. I think that takes care of the business end of things, so now I'd love to tell you a little bit about our guests. Tonight I have the very great honor of introducing Win Ba Chum and Martha Collins here to discuss and celebrate the release of their new translation of Dreaming the Mountain, the North American debut of one of the great cultural figures of modern Vietnam. Win Ba Chum is a writer, poet, and translator whose essays and translations have appeared in Vietnam Forum, New Asia Review, Boston Review, and Nation, among others. Beginning in 1987, he was associated with the William Joyner Center at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, responsible for bringing Vietnamese writers to Boston, translating their poetry and short stories, and introducing them to an American audience. In 1996, he started working full-time there and began a summer study program with Wei University. He is the co-translator of over a dozen works, including A Time Far Past, From a Corner of My Yard, Distant Road, Six Vietnamese Poets, and Carrying the Mountain and River on Our Shoulders. Several collections of his own poetry have been published in Vietnam. Martha Collins has published 11 volumes of poetry, most recently Casualty Reports, and Because What Else Could I Do?, which won the Poetry Society of America's William Carlos Williams Award. Her previous books include a trilogy of works that focus on race, beginning with Blue Front, and followed by White Papers and Admit One, an American scrapbook. She has also published four previous volumes of co-translated Vietnamese poetry and co-edited a number of volumes, including with Kevin Pfeiffer, Pfeiffer into English Poems, Translations, Commentaries. She's the founder of the Creative Writing Program at UMass Boston and former professor of creative writing at Oberlin. And tonight's moderator, Fred Marchant, is the author of five books of poetry, the most recent of which is Said, Not Said, published by Grey Wolf Press and recognized as an honors book by the Massachusetts Book Awards. His first book, Tipping Point, won the 1993 Washington Prize and was reissued in a 20th anniversary second edition. An emeritus professor of English and the founding director of the Poetry Center at Suffolk University, he is the editor of Another World Instead, a selection of the early poems of William Stafford. He has also co-translated with Win Wat Chun works by many Vietnamese poets. I'm so pleased to have them here together in conversation, and I'm Chun, Martha, and Fred. Such a joy to see you. Many folks are have were associated with the Joyner Center, and so there's a bit of a homecoming. It was the earlier iteration of the Joyner Center, and um, it is a bit of a homecoming. For those who are new to the, that context, welcome, sincere welcome to you. I am Fred Marshall, it's true, and I am going to be a moderator. I'm a very moderate guy, and um, <laughs> I, I want to try to moderate this evening. I'll do a bit of an introduction, but it's only a bit. It's, it's relatively short, and, and it's a way of trying to talk about the structure of this evening. Before I, before I do that, though, I forgot this. The one thing I wanted to remember, there's, there's, a, there's a, a person who we really need to thank way in the background of all of this, and that's Kevin Bowen, um, the former director of the Joyner Center. He can't be with us. Maybe he's live streaming. I don't know if you are, Kevin. <laughs> in his 20 plus years as the director of the Joyner Center, he understood that root that, that post-conflict cultural exchange was an absolutely essential to the dimension of peacemaking. Our first task tonight is to pronounce, really see, his name properly. And so I asked Martha a couple of days ago, well, please help me, Martha did, but you see it didn't take. Could you say his name, please, Martha? Yeah, how about you? 
对，十一，对，十一，不好意思。I also I can't help myself, you know, from from years of classroom teaching. I can't help but show a few and tell a few things. One of these wonderful photographs. I found a treasure trove of photographs of this of this man. And so I laid I laid them on the table and later in the afternoon. Particularly like this one. It's ter terrible color, but it's it's the it's the it's the it's the bodhisattva's posture. Yeah. And this this is this is sweeping Zen. <laughs> but he was was born in 1943 in a large southern city of Laos, Pakistan. 1953, he entered a Zen order, the absolute most predominant Zen order uh, in, in Vietnam. He studied um, at the Institute of Buddhism in Nha Trang, and then moved to Saigon, where he later graduated from the College of Buddhism in 1964. 1965, he also graduated from the Van Han University uh, in Saigon. And in 1970, he became a professor there. In 73, he left Saigon for, as a, as a Buddhist monk, he left Saigon for the solitude of the, hill, the hillsides uh, of Nha Trang, and, and Nha Trang being a Buddhist, central Buddhist study. As all of you will recall, which looks like in the day, 1975 was the year um, that then was um, consolidated as control of the entire country and the Communist Party. Um, uh, in particular, um, in 1978, he returned to Saigon from Nha and was then sent to a re education camp for two years, fundamentally a prison. There is the broader sense he had. And Fred, uh, Fred, you can't hear you. You can't hear me. No. Still. Is it me? It's on, but it needs to aim at your mouth. Aim it right at you. Yeah, really talk. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, I wanted it down in my heart. That's where the words come from. Right. How's that? Good? Yeah. <laughs> You, you probably know also that, that in a general sense that the, the, the Communist Party um, you know, was suppressed. Am I okay? Yeah. Raise your hand if you can't hear. Thank you. After he, um, after he put two years in prison, he had then um, um, a worse time. In 1984, he was arrested sent to prison for 14 years. He was released in 1998. He, during that time, he was given a death sentence, and reduced, that was reduced to 20 years in uh, prison. And then at the end of that, he was, in fact, offered a chance. He was, the legend goes that he was offered a chance to ask for leniency officially. He refused to run a fast. And uh, eventually, human rights organizations around the world, and some American congressmen, I might add, um, uh, leaned in. Uh, and the government relented. Yeah. As far as one knows, there were no poems written during this time of the long imprisonment, but there were poems um, during the first two years of um, re-education. We're going to use what I just said in terms of the dates as the structure of this night. We're going to, we're going to do, my colleagues are going to read in Viet, some in Vietnamese, some in English, in both languages. Um, Pair of poems from those epochs in um, the poet's life. In addition to his poetry, however, you will hear um, many things about Buddhism and Zen in particular. And Tutsi is really one of the you know great figures of Buddhist thought in Vietnam and perhaps in the world. And he's also is a philosopher. He translated not only all the, the sutras. Um, of the Buddha, but he also translated European philosophers such as Heidegger and Foucault. Published over 50 works. And I'm going to try to end this little introduction quickly by saying this. Around 2016, he gave a talk at Van Han University in Saigon. The topic was Buddhism and the education of the young. A professor there, Hua Dam, introduced to Isi by saying that his discourse today to Isi's would be, quote, like a streaming, a steaming cup of tea. We shall try to receive the offer and sip 
the room to individually taste the wonder of tea. I love the way the metaphor conjures the tea ceremony. In Vietnamese Zen, it's a ceremony that is indeed a meditation practice unto itself. I think the metaphor might also apply to uh, Tutsi's poetry. You, you could say you'll sip it tonight. You will, I think, experience the wonder not only of his words, but the wonder of a life so deeply devoted to what we might call the truth of Zen and Zen Buddhism. Having said that, let me then turn. Should I sit down? Should I go sit down now? Yeah. And turn the turn the microphone over to Martha Collins. Uh, I think. Hello. All right, can you hear and can you see all right? Is it okay if we stay seated so we're not bouncing up and down? All right, uh, the first poem, and the first thing you're going to hear is a poem in Vietnamese, which Chum will read, and then I will read the English. That's usually the way translation works, but after that, we're going to do the reverse so that you can hear the poem in English and then hear the Vietnamese so you'll sort of know what's going on when you're listening. Um, I want you to listen carefully to the music of these poems. These are formal poems. Uh, Vietnamese poetry, formal Vietnamese poetry, uh, has a lot of characteristics that include tone and syllabic count as well as rhyme, uh, which we've only a little bit tried to capture in English. So Chum will read, the first thing you will hear is a poem in Vietnamese, and then I will read the translation. And then we'll reverse, and you won't hear trans, you won't hear the Vietnamese for all of the poems. Chum. Hello? Yeah. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> Mưa cao nguyên Một con em Một đoạn đường lây lấp Một đêm dài Nghe thác đổ trên cao Ta bước vội Qua dòng sông biển biển Đợi như dòng Trong cánh bướm xuân Bóng ma gọi Tên người mỗi sáng Từng ngày qua từng tiếng mu vơ mưa xanh bên tóc quyền xưa nặng trong giấc mơ lá già xa bờ người đứng mãi giữa lòng sông nhuộm nắng kể chuyện gì nơi ngày cũ xa xưa con bướm nhỏ đi về trong cánh mỏng nhưng về đâu một chiếc lá xa mùa năm tháng vẫn như nụ cười trong mộng người mãi đi như nước chảy xa nguồn bờ bến là chút tự tình với bóng mây lạc loài ơi tóc cũ ngàn năm rainy season in the highland a swallow a hazardous stretch of road a tall waterfall heard through a long night stepping quickly across a vanished river, waiting for rain in the flutter of butterflies. A ghost calls your name each morning, day by day, sound by pointless sound. Rain greens black hair heavy with dew. In dreams, leaves drift far away from shore. For a long time, you stand in the sunlit river, telling tales of what far places and times. A small butterfly travels on fragile wings, but where can a leaf go away from its season? Months and years are like smiles and dreams. You keep going on as water runs from its source. Strange shores tell their secrets to the shadows. Stray clouds a thousand years ago old hair. I promise.
was, um, people, I would tell you the numbers of the columns, the page numbers, so if you have the book, you can follow along. That was on page nine. I'm sorry I didn't announce that one. But the next poem um, is on page three. It's the first poem in the book. These poems are from the time when um, when Boise uh, was uh, still uh, partly living in Saigon, uh, but before the end of the war. These are early poems. That last one was from 1971. I'm not sure the date of this. A piece of old sky. Damp young eyes, sky over old gatherings. A deserted hill, a blue dress, no longer blue. Rushing, I see myself as a vagabond, telling stories by lamplight, a fading moon. From cold mountain to sea, forever silent. This stony crest, those salt grains haven't dissolved. Smile in the sunlight, how quickly a day passes. Today, winter, tomorrow, summer. How sad. I count my silver hairs, but I'm not old. Tired feet walk back and forth on the dusty road. Looking back, I see four sullen walls. A distant stream runs up and down through the forest. Khung trời cũ Đôi mắt ướt tuổi vàng Khung trời hồn cũ Áo màu xanh Không xanh mãi trên đồi Phút vội vã Bỗng thấy mình du khủ Thập đèn khuya Ngồi kể chuyện trăm tàn Từ núi lạnh Đến biển im muôn hòa Tình đã này và hạt muối đó chưa tan Cười với nắng một ngày sao chóng thế Ngay mùa đông mai mùa hạ buồn chăng Đếm tóc bạc tuổi đời chưa đủ Bụi đường dài gọt mỏi đi quanh Giờ ngó lại cuốn vách tường ủ rũ Suối rừng xa ngược nước xuôi ngàn Now, friends, I'm, I'm a reader and a participant with you. You know, our thinking was that, that I would, my moderation would serve as a way of raising some questions and making some observations on what I've just heard. But you know, think of your own, and by the way, save them, because we're going to build 15 minutes in. And so let me begin by saying, yes, these were poems early on before imprisonment. And, and they are, but they are, he is a monk by this time. And so what I notice about these poems right away, and I notice it in both languages, and perhaps you did too, that there is a, there is a great devotion to the line as a unit, moving down the page. In fact, these poems <clears throat> practically have, well, they have little, we'll put it that way, very little connective tissue. There's no, you know, this, caused that, or this led to that, or I felt this because, things of that order. It's, it's a set of images, often, that are, that are layered, and I think that's a beautiful image that Martha uses in her introduction. It's a layered set of imagery. It suggested to me something out of, you know, our common carpentry experience, the way laminated wood, pieces of wood can be laminated and made the whole piece being made strong. <laughs> and then there's something else, and I'm now going to turn to you folks about this and wonder if this is your thought. If, if what I just said is true about the lineation, the line being the central unit in his art, at least in these poems, and each line is an integral unit, actually, then, and there's little connective tissue, is it not true? <laughs> is it not true that, um, that the reader is asked to do some work? and to do the work of the poem in a way. And not necessarily making connective tissue, but as you hear it, or as you read it, you start to see it in its existence, and you follow the movement of that mind. Absolutely. 
<laughs> yeah. We did not rehearse that. <laughs> the, I think the rule in uh, American poetry is you usually use a lot of connected connection. As for and for ever. So you have an idea what the poet is trying to say. Here, uh, basically you are left alone to figure that out. And so sometimes you figure that out this way. Somebody else could figure out that way. And so uh, Vietnamese poetry, I guess similar to Chinese poetry, is unified in the sense that it does not forbid contradiction. Because the idea in Zen is that you have to rise above contradiction. And so the contradiction is not considered as a weakness, but a strength. Mm -hmm. so what, contra what contradictions were you thinking of in these two poems? I think you can read it, and then you can figure out whatever way you want that make it different. You could figure out one way. We, we could have the contradictory right. experiences of yeah. the poem, correct? Yeah. yeah. Which has been one interesting thing about working with Jill. We can talk a little later, perhaps, about how we did these translations. Um, but uh, getting an answer from Chung, you know, <laughs> how should I do this? Uh, and there are many, many things in the language that also make it difficult, um, which we can talk about a little later if we have time. Um, I think we should move on to the next section, which is the poems that uh, Dwight C.E. wrote after the war, uh, starting in 1960, 1975. Um, a difficult time. These poems uh, are particularly moving to me as our own country uh, increasingly is at odds with itself. And a divided country is something that uh, Dwayne C.E. felt very strongly. This next poem has a little more structure than uh, the, the last conversation or the other poems were suggesting. But uh, it's one of my favorite poems. It's a poem that in some sense gives you a little summary of Dwayne C.E.'s life up until the time, which is 1975. Um, this is on page 23. The year, oh, and I should say, uh, the Chong Sun, uh, we're gonna do that next. Um, the Ch can that, if that's okay. Okay, the Chong Sun is a mountain range. Uh, the Ammonites is what they're usually called in English. Uh, and Chung can talk a little more um, when we read the next poem about uh, the particular significance of that, which will come up in that poem as well. Um, uh, okay. <clears throat> this was written in the forest, right? The years away. The wind gave you ten long years of wandering, seeing your country only in its ruin. The eastern sea still whispers to white sand tales of compassion breath of the Jung Sun. Ten more years you were silent in the city. Love for the forest brought you close to tears. Arms reached for the sky, the birds late chirping. Life adrift, small wings closing up by the road. Ten years later you crossed streams and forests, saw your country as bloody abandoned fields. Evening smoke fades like wounded souls. Each river, each stream of blood and tears overflows. For 10 years, you forgot your weak, thin weakness. On slender shoulders, a new country arose. You bent your head to hear mountain and forest chanting the endless love song of the East. The day you came back to the ancient city, Roads were still shadowed with sorrow's smoke. Eyes still shone with timeless indignation, as fresh as rain in the borderlands, as true. And uh, I'm going to we'll now turn to the poem on page 29, a very short quatrain. And maybe you could say a little bit more about the significance of that 
um, 29 and 30, uh, of the, the peak, and also maybe the last line. Let me read it first, and then I'll let you read Reflection, page 29. I can still hear the cicada's song, can still love the night fire's flames. Home is just a peak in the June sun. Let's proclaim our thousand-year indignation. Chung Sun, as you know, is a range, mountain range in Vietnam, that went from the north to the south. And during the war, it was the major uh, road that the North Vietnamese used to supply to the south. And so it, it is a dominant figure in Vietnamese history and geography. It just happened that Tuệ Sĩ was born in Bắc Sê Lào, near the Trường Sơn. So he was very much into Trường Sơn since he was a child. And when he grew up, uh, that figure dominated his thinking. He said that uh, the reason that he think of Trường Sơn was when, in 1975, he was sitting in the Zen temple in Nha Trang. And he could hear the sounds of the North Vietnamese troop entering the city. And he could see the people all rouse up. And he realized that his life probably has come to a major change because he knew that in the North, Buddhism was stifled for a long time. So he realized that from now on, he might not have the same freedom, the same opportunity to practice his real religion as he did. And therefore, he imagined that Vietnam was like the peak of Trường Sơn, bombarded by hurricanes from all sides. And he think of Vietnam as a country buffeted by these storms all over around itself. And that image stayed him for the rest of his life. That's why he called his book of poem The Dream of Chun Sun. Tự tình Còn nghe được tiếng ve sầu Còn yêu đốm lửa Đêm sâu và thùng Quê người trên đỉnh Trường Sơn cho ta gửi một nỗi hờn thiên thu. And that, that peak uh, in the Chung Sun, that line I love, uh, that Chung Sun goes all the way through the book and home is just a peak, right? Um, I want to read um, from the same period another quatrain um, and then Fred may have something to say. This picks up the idea of dreaming from the title. This is on page 37. Fleeting dream. Emerald eyes on a great festival day. That smile fades to sunset's afterglow. Like a white stork against a deep green field. I love because the world is a moment's dream. And one more poem from this period. This is now 1976, My Father's Shadow, on page 41. 15 years on the road, oh father, <coughs> such heartbreaking pain while I wandered. I pictured you sitting through long nights, white hair on a high pillow, my body churned. In this fleeting life I've not flourished, dreaming of cream's wing, fearing heaven's designs. Under the moon, the shifting tides, the horizon beguiles, the wanderer's eye dims. Deep in fading dreams, fearing your death, alone in an inn, stung by my prayer's smoke. I, I go back to the first two poems and note what an extraordinary thing it is to say that um, and then how he characterizes the post-war mindset is 
a timeless indignation. Use of the word indignation in both of those two poems. Right, what an extraordinary word, and what a great word to have chosen. Involving dignity, uh, something, the dignity of, of the country in some way is, is harmed you know, by, by the war that's just ended. Um, secondly, with these two poems, and all of the ones we've been working with so far, you can sense the evanescence, the presence of things that disappear. The things that are always in motion, that are never stable in some way, and dreams are one version of that. Um, it's funny though, in a, a certain way, there's another kind of stability, and I'm not sure how to put it, but it's the stability of mind or mindfulness, the stability of being able to register these things. And, and I, I also wonder if it isn't true that he thought of his own practice as above ideology, political ideologies. Yes, uh, according to uh, Buddhist tradition, especially the ancient Buddhist tradition in Vietnam, Buddhism has over 2,000 years history in Vietnam. And the first few uh, centuries were actually helped the king to run, run the country. And it was uh, those illustrious times that Vietnam became an independent country. So um, it, it has always played its role to support the country, especially against invasion. And in all its 2,000 years history, it has never betrayed the country, except one or two individuals. But by all the great majority, they always support the country against foreign invasion. And the reason that they could do that, because those monks lived the life of the Buddhist practitioner. They would not involve themselves in politics, because politics is not what they're concerned about. They are concerned about the ethical foundation of the country, and about how to lead people so that they could live a moral life, a good life. Therefore, that's one of the reasons that create the current opposition between the party and the unified Buddhist church. The party want church to join the Buddhist association organized by the government. Because as a Buddhist, we will die the communist government would not allow any organization in the country to be independent. It has to be part of the structure of the party. And uh, when that was requested of uh, Unified Buddhist Church, he declined. He said that we are a religious organization. We are not a political organization. We would not become a mean for politics to use us. And that's why that to this day, Tracy remains steadfast to this idea. Unfortunately, of course, politics interfered with Tracy. Uh, and the next little section of poems we're going to read, starting on page 55, a poem called I Still Wait. Uh, this was written in 1978, just before he was sent to re-education camp for two years in prison-like conditions. Um, and you'll see uh, his reference to that. This is a poem I'm very fond of. I stand, Trim will read it in Vietnamese after I read the English. I still wait. I still wait through long, restless nights. Pale green cries sound from the forest edge. In hatred's darkness, there is still love. A star brims like tears beside my lips. I still wait through black, windless nights, the pure, shimmering black of ancient eyes. I look deep to lengthen history's path, a river of blood and tears over the land. I still wait to forget the beating waves, the Pacific Ocean 
the people back and forth. Those who stayed ache in the tyrant's hands, slender reeds weighed down by the sun at dusk. Then, with a frail body, I face prison, fingers tapping time on a mossy wall. Then, my eyes closed, I go to the dream place, like early dew, like lightning, like evening clouds. Tôi vẫn đợi, tôi vẫn đợi những đêm xanh khắc khoải, màu xanh sao trong tiếng khóc ven rừng, trong bóng tối hận thù tha thiết mãi, một vì sao bên khóe miệng rưng rưng. Tôi vẫn đợi những đêm đen lặng gió, màu đen tuyền ánh mắt tự ngàn xưa, nhìn hun hút cho dài thêm lịch sử dài con sông tràn máu lệ quê cha tôi vẫn đợi suốt đời quên sóng gỗ quên những người xuôi ngược thái bình dương ngựa lại giữa lòng tay bạo chúa cong lao gầy chịu nặng ánh tà xương rồi trước mặt ngục tù thân bé bỏng ngón tay nào gõ nhịp xuống tường rêu rồi nhắm mắt ta đi vào cõi mộng như sương mai don't you love the sound of you? Mm, yes. <laughs> I think I, I, my Vietnamese was very, very little when I went to Vietnam for the first time, but I did make a joke. I said, when Vietnamese people see, speak, it's like the birds singing. Um, and I was asking her, what kind of birds? <laughs> while uh, Toy Fee was in re-education camp, which is to say, really, in prison. Uh, there's a longish poem or sequence of poems called Sitting in the Graveyard. And uh, we'll just read, I'll read the English and then uh, show the Vietnamese, the fourth section, which is on page 67. A life, a short stretch of rough road. I listen all night long to a waterfall. I step quickly over a long lost river, waiting for rain to drizzle on butterfly wings. One morning, my eyes flood with the past. The dark road connects to my former lives. I stand forever in an endless forest stream, a fleeting dream of red blood at dusk. Một kiếp sống, một đoạn đường lây lấp, một đêm dài nghe thác đổ trên cao. Ta bước vội qua dòng sông biển biệt, đợi mưa rầm trong cánh bướm xuân sao. Một buổi sáng mắt bóng đầy quá khứ, đường ngấm u nối lại mấy tiền thân. Ta đứng mãi trên suối ngàn vĩnh viễn, mộng vô thường, máu đỏ giữa hoàng hôn. While uh, Toysi was in re-education camp, he wrote a sequence called Sleep Talking in Prison, uh, a sequence of quatrains that he wrote in classical Chinese. And um, we have three of them in the book, two tr translated into Vietnamese by Chung. If you turn to page 71, you'll see transliterated Chinese, uh, Vietnamese, and the English. Um, shall we read the two of these? Okay. Um, I'll read the first one, and then you can read it in Vietnamese. This is a famous poem, right? Very famous. Okay. Dedication. Two hands lift the prison bowl of rice to dedicate it to the Lord of all. World overflowing with blood and strife. Bowl raised as wordless tears fall. Cúng dường, xin dâng chén cơm tù này, cúng dường được Phật tháng ngày xót thương. Thế gian, vết hận miên trường, 
vững chém cơm đồ vô ngôn mẹ chào This become very famous poem because it was done while he was in prison. And this basically describes the way that a monk, when you, before you eat, you have a ceremony. You pray to Buddha. Uh, but he described his praying that at the, at the time, the world was filled with blood and strife. The country at the time was filled in great difficulties. There's a lot of uh, <coughs> hunger, there's a lot of uh, strife, especially with the embargo by the US, 20 years. So, Taizan, Vietnam, Minh Trường, world overflowing with blood and strife. So he raised the bow to no, the Buddha and Vô Moon Lê Chào, would let tears fall. Tears would down his arm, just fall. Because he think of the problem the people is suffering. Maybe this is a point at which I should say something about our process because it was kind of amazing how many emails, we did all of this by email, uh, Jim would do a very rough translation of the Vietnamese. I insistently always wrote out the Vietnamese and read it to myself in my very terrible Vietnamese, uh, but did my own kind of version of it so that I knew exactly what was going on with every word. And then I would work with my version of my mess and his version, send it back to Jim, he would send it back to me, I would send it back to him. I don't know how many times we went back and forth, but you wouldn't believe how many times we sent this poem, this four-line poem, back and forth. Sometimes the things that seem easiest are the hardest. And uh, we were both very fussy on both ends. Chum wanted exactly to get as close to the Vietnamese as possible, and meaning I wanted it to sound like a poem in English without losing the Vietnamese flavor. So uh, I can't tell you what went into the translation of that, but I know it was a lot. I'm going to read this other quatrain, and uh, then we'll read one more poem, and then maybe have conversation. Uh, still on page 71 in the second poem. Narrow Cage. I live in a narrow cage, but I am content. Lighthearted, free, I walk back and forth. I laugh and talk listening to myself. A long prison day passes as if it were nothing. Long chật hẹp, long chật, dòng vẫn tự tại, nhàn du bách bộ quanh phòng, nói cười một mình mình biết, một ngày tù dài như không. So that is Jim's translation of classical Chinese. <laughs> Um, the last poem I think we'll read in the interest of time is um, a poem that was written in 1983, um, shortly before uh, Chung had been, uh, um, Si had been released from re-education camp in 1980 and was sent back to prison in 1984 for 14 years, as Fred mentioned earlier. This is a poem anticipating that. I'll read it in English. And, Yes, I will give you that. I will read it in English, and then Chum will read it in Vietnamese, and it's on page 83 in English and 82 in Vietnamese. Descending the mountain. Tomorrow the monk will descend the mountain, a frayed thin robe on his shoulders. Prayer beads consume the years. No incense reaches the drinkers. At dawn the monk will descend the mountain, his white hair vexed by labor. In the east, the sun will be red. No clouds fly in summer. Tomorrow, the monk will descend the mountain, the city his last impasse. Now he coughs in the darkness. That temple grows deep and vast. At dawn, the monk will descend the mountain, tears at the rims of his eyes. 
Because the monk loves darkness, nightmares wait on the forest path. À, Sơn, ngày mai sư xuống núi áo mỏng Sơn đôi vai chuối hạt mòn năm tháng hương trầm lỡ cuộc say bình minh sư xuống núi tóc trắng hờn sinh nhai phương đông mặt trời đỏ mùa hạ không mây bay ngày mai sư xuống núi phố thị bước đường cùng sư ho trong bóng tối điện phật trầm mông lung bình minh sư xuống núi khóc khóe mắt còn rưng rưng vì sư yêu bóng tối ác mộng giữa đường rừng Um, I think that's, again, in the interest of time, all the poems we'll read, but I'd like to point out that um, uh, we don't know that Toysi wrote any poems in prison, but since his release, after his release, um, he's written several sequences of poems, and in the back of the book, uh, at the end of the book, you'll find um, two sequences um, in short sections. Med uh, meditation room and uh, refrains for piano. But I think we should stop there, yes? And um, if you have questions, have comments. Have and then comments or questions, and then we'll open it up. There was one moment early on in I Still Wake, that poem that really caught my ear this time for the first time. And it's this line in English. Those who stayed, it's on page 55, those who stayed ache in the tyrant's hands. And that, 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 and that clipped my mind quickly. I realized, of course, so, so many Vietnamese emigrated, and that's the kindest way to put the word, right? You know, left the country. And, and those who stayed ached in the tyrant's hand. I thought that history entered into to, to say, poetry at that moment, for sure, you know? Well, I, I think uh, if we put our position of Toy Say, some of his brother monks were killed in prison. Not, not one self. And his whole church were suppressed. So in his mind, it's a type of behavior in his country. The, 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 the communist government brought many good things to the country. The first thing they did was they brought quick peace and they rebuilt the country. But if you put yourself in the position of Toy Sin, as an individual monk of a church that's being suppressed by the government, you would have a total different experience. That's where that line came from. We're going to make these other two comments very short because they really are koan-like. Um, one of the most extraordinary things is to is to feel in any way the presence of nothing, of nothingness. That is the accomplishment, really, of, you know, at least from my point of view, of meditation. Do you think these poems are, in fact, enacting meditation? And is that sense of it happens actually in literally in sleep talking in prison. And, and, and the third one it does, but the, what is it called, the Zen of nothingness. Well, I mean, uh, what I see is a practicing Zen, Zen practitioner. You wake up uh, every day at about 2 a.m. And, and sit in meditation for two, three hours every day. And uh, he has such a deep, Actually, one of the uh, famous monks who actually became a monk in the U.S., Mahzak, said that it takes three centuries and a half for the man to produce a monk like Tracy, who is so deep into Buddhist religion that he could convey things that very few people could convey. And that's the value of his poetry, is that it, it is then in a very, very sort of as if it is not. You read it, and it sort of seems quiet.
quietly into you without raising any issues or raising any questions. You just absorb it and you could feel its feelings. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, I think we should open the floor now. We've got about 10 minutes, I think. And so we, we can always go back and revi revisit things. Yes? It was the actually it was the it was the there were three quatrains in the sleepwalking sleep talking in prison I sleepwalk in <laughs> sleep talking in prison and the third of the one the one we didn't read the Martha and did not read was there's a Zen of nothingness is the phrase that's in that poem. I'll just read it. Yeah. Solitary cell on page seventy three. I live in a sky of boundless space, a Zen landscape of nothingness. No things, no people, no busyness, just flowers strewn by the goddess. Thoughts, observations, questions, anything? Yes, Molly. Wow, it was so, so deeply moving. I felt every single phrase could be, was a poem on its own, or could be a meditation for the morning, or could, I mean, I'm just gonna sit with that, waiting for the rain to drizzle on the butterflies wings or whatever, or the mossy fingers, the image after image after image that brought me into the center of my being somehow. And I'm just really grateful to hear this work languages at least. Thank you, Molly. Other thoughts? I'm, I'm uh, literally thrilled with the translation because the, the song of the Vietnamese is intense <laughs> and it, it's not lost in the translation and that's a big risk any kind of translation, but something that is so intensely musical to, to carry over in Kafka. And <coughs> could we well, ask the translator a question about that? I, I really yeah. wanted to ask this question. Go for it. I agree with you. And what, how did you handle rhyme? Uh, okay, uh, uh, in the introduction, you'll find a translator's note that explains this in some detail. But um, the lines. Um, of when the, uh, many of these poems are written in eight syllable lines. Uh, Vietnamese is a monosyllabic language. Um, the equivalent in English is sometimes four syllables for a one syllable word. Um, and we, we don't really think in, in syllabics in English, even though haiku often get translated that way. Um, so I settled on a kind of loose, iambic pentameter line. Uh, very loose, sometimes tetrameter, sometimes pentameter. Four stresses, five stresses. Um, which gave me a kind, that's something I started out writing when I was, when I first started, I was a formalist. And so that's what I did. It's not a translation, it's a complete translation of form. Uh, as for rhyme, what I tried to do was have, if it was a quatrain, that, that poem dedication was thoroughly rhymed, but I tried to have at least one rhyme somewhere in the quatrain. Uh, if these poems had been translated 10 times before, I would have been much freer in the way I did things, but, but I was honoring Jim's insistence and my own. Uh, of being as accurate as possible. So it's a kind of ratcheting down and translation of the form that's there. Uh, I, I would have found it impossible to do these poems, to translate them without trying to get some sense of music into them. So thank you very much for the question. And thank you to Chum for, for putting up with me when I said, no, no, we can't do that because, because there are too many syllables. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh, the end result in terms of the uh, sound of the poem is entirely due to Martha. And, I, and there's no way I can do it. <laughs> but, but I tell you, if form and content ever met uh, 
in a po in, in poems in conversation between us. It was really quite thrilling, and that's why uh, there was so much back and forth. I just want to uh, piggyback on that gratitude that. I feel like for us as English speakers to hear the Vietnamese and the English together, as you talk about how it came about and analyzing a little bit of the process, uh, that's interesting. But to experience the sound back and forth, it's like a hammock between two trees that, that talk to each other. And, and in the middle there someplace, something happens that I don't think you can name. But it's so beautiful to hear that and to then hear about your process of making that come to be it's like wow there's there's a quite famous translator who who described the process of translating as taking the poem out of one language and before you put it in the other one it's there and i think one of the thrills of translation is that you have this poem sitting there in no language at some point uh which is Really kind of magical. Thanks for that metaphor. I love the metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Any other questions? Anybody or comments? Yeah. So the biography you described, if it happened to someone like me, I would have felt strong emotions of anger, resentment, hatred, aggression. Um, how did you handle strong emotion as you wrote these poems? Particularly negative emotions. Trans translating. Yeah. <coughs> Are they in the poems? Well, you can talk about. I think he's asking about the poems more than the translations. Well, no, even today when I read the poem, I'm still moved by it. Yeah. It's uh, it's such. A, I mean, the thing is that he didn't say anything about story or anything. He just used image. River about the flower, and somehow this image get to you and fall in, in your being, and then you, you, you just seize by it. And so, no, uh, uh, that's why I uh, love to translate his poetry because it's such a unique kind of poetry. I, I think. Um you're asking about how you would feel. And of course, everything that Jim was saying about uh, the Buddhist practice of this poet indicates that he's not, or trying not to. Um, I, I guess I would like to say a little something which isn't gonna be very, very scholarly, but one of the things that I've, I've been translating Vietnamese poetry, co-translating always with somebody else. My Vietnamese is almost non-existent now, except to me. Um, but one of the hardest things for me has been to translate emotion. I have an essay about this. How do you translate emotion? And how particularly do you translate emotion from a culture in which emotion is differently experienced? The first thing I had to know, first thing I had to learn was to appreciate sorrow, to appreciate the words for sorrow, to experience them in a positive way. Uh, the first poet I translated had a line about sadness, the jewel of his native village. Um, there's a word that uh, we have trouble with in here. It's translated as rancor, uh, which is about as negative, Lewis, as the emotional words get. But as Drew points out in a note in the back, it's a word that is not altogether negative in Vietnamese. So um, the emotions are complex. Um, is one thing to say, and the other thing to say is, with this particular poet, the emotions that you or I probably would have experienced, he did not. That is not to say that the emotions are not incredibly complex. Yeah. And then we so something that sticks in my mind in this context is the phrase, the thousand years of indignation. And I think um, what I took from that, there's so much I don't know yet, but what I took from that was this country has suffered for a thousand years. Uh, and um, I mean, I don't know what's going to come 
So that's that's just what I took from that, and it, it, it addresses your points to some extent. It, it also could add that, that maybe, just maybe, I think Martha's exposition about the differences in emotional life is so profound. I would just add to it that, that I think his sense of emotion is Zen-like. That is to say, they come and go. They, the feeling comes through, you know, to borrow the Thich Nhat Han slogan, right? They come and go like clouds on a windy, windy day, but conscious breathing is my anchor. You know, that it's that sense that that even the indignation of a thousand years is evanescent. It's time is of that nature. And you mentioned indignation, yeah. which which we use quite a bit in these poems, and uh, uh, that's that's kind of the word that Lewis is looking for. Maybe uh, not rage, not anger, not whatever uh, indignation. Yes, uh, the word indignation in Vietnamese have both a positive and a negative meaning, depending on the user. So in this, uh, it, it is not negative. It, for example, indignation because of your disappointment in something that the country should have achieved. That is a very positive indication because something you want good for the country and yet somehow it never achieved. So that indignation is considered to be positive. Mm. Uh, and uh, yes. No, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Okay. Sorry. Um, I was thinking about that line and I had actually realized I wasn't sure if it was a thousand years of indignation that we've been indignant for a thousand years or if we are now proclaiming that will last a thousand years. It's all up to your interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> and, I thought, and as I was thinking about that, I, I, I was trying to, I'm thinking about this poet's relationship with history. And it strikes me, strikes me that he's a sort of prism for the, this light that passes through him. And, it's, and there's a thousand years of history and there's a thousand years to come. And it's all sort of the same light passing through him. That's how I thought, that's how I read that. Uh, Jim's comment is a good way, maybe, for us to end yeah. with, with that. Uh, no, no, I, 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 I love the multivalent dimensions of things. For instance, the dream. You know, dreams are wonderful and they can be nightmares. He's, he just he says so, that's the thing. Thank you all. If you want to come up and chat, we're here. And uh, thank you so much.